Today, we will be covering broadly the following topics. Different types of LM guides. What are the application of the various types of LM guides? How to select the LM guide? Having selected the LM guide, how to use, uh, design using that LM guide? Incorporate, in other words, the design. And having designed that, how to assemble it? And uh, lastly, we will be also discussing briefly on how to select the size of the guide because uh, very detailed analysis is not possible to be covered in such a uh, small time. But we will be talking about, uh, let us say, the basics of how to analyze, calculate, and do the selection of the LM guides. So these are the various topics. Now, let us start. Now, uh, let us look at the guideway evolution. All of us know we had these dovetail guides, V and flat guides, box guides, uh, let us say for the last 200, 250 years, approximately. In fact, I Googled it just to find out how, uh, how many years back the guides were there. So I found something like 1761 or something like that. Uh, already people had designed machines with uh, uh, guideways, uh, frictional guideways. The, uh, okay, then the latest one was the box guide, uh, which was in vogue right in the early, 90, uh, early part of 1900. Then we had the real high-end guide, which is hydrostatic guideways, which as per Googling again, uh, I found out that it is early 60s, 1961, 62, something like that. The hydrostatic guideways were the really high-end guideways uh, in machine tools. One thing you have to note is all these guides, these were specially or custom designed for each application. There was no uh, something like a bearing. Something was not readily available as a product, which could be incorporated into the design. We had to design independently for each application based on the knowledge acc accrued. So we could design either a box guide or a dovetail guide or a, a flat and we, depending upon uh, what was the guide function, what was the machine function, accuracy, et cetera, et cetera. Now, DHK developed the first set of LM guides, linear motion guides, in something around 1972-73, around that time, uh, THK Japan developed the LM guides. The purpose of this was that we should have a standardized product available, which can be uh, selected from a catalog and purchased and built, machine built. That was the whole purpose of this. And now, uh, not only we have a standard LM guide, which are, most of you are aware of, we also have, uh, for instance, a eight row LM guide. You can see in the topmost right corner, that is a guide where there are eight rows of uh, ball, ball rows, and that is almost same as function in performance wise, hydrostatic guideways. So to that extent, the development of this LM guides has taken place. Yeah, so this is the LM rail. Everybody calls it the LM rail, so there is no confusion. Whereas this is called the LM block. THK, we call it as LM block. Some people call it as runner block. Some people, uh, manufacturers call it as shoe. So there are different uh, names they call it, but all of them basically mean the uh, the LM, that is the unit, which moves on the rail. The LM block has uh, balls inside or rollers, depending upon whether you have selected a ball LM guide or a roller LM guide. Then it has a end plate. See, this, this is the end plate, one end, and this is the end plate at the other end. The ball recirculates like that. That means the ball turns back in the end plate and the LM basic steel part, that is, this is the steel part that will have a straight raceway only. So the ball turns back in the end plates. And of course, then you have end seal, side seal, like that. The four rows 
well, we call the four row because as you can see the top there are two rows and bottom there are two rows totally forming four rows so one two three four that is why we call this as four row lm guides the raceways of the lm rail normally are induction hardened to around 62 61rc the raceway of the lm block is case hardened to see basically the hardest part is the ball typically 63 64rc the next hardest part is the raceways of the lm block which will have one or two points lesser heat uh, hardness and the the smallest hardness smallest means among the three is the lm rail that will have another one or two points lower hardness the reason is this the balls are continuously in engagement with the, the both the lm block and the lm rail the lm block at least has some area where the balls will be ex uh, the load bearing areas will be more and lm rail of obviously very long so the load will be distributed over a larger area so that is why we maintain a nominal uh, difference of about a point or two of hardness between the rail the block and the balls now we so we had uh, as i told you sometime around 1973 around that the lm guides was developed where the ba the balls used to touch each other that means the you can see on the left side the normal or standard lm guides one ball pushes the other ball like that it uh, recirculates now what happens because the balls are touching each other you can see here so there will be rubbing rubbing of the balls so the temperature will go up the lubrication film may fail etc now phk developed the lm guide with ball cage so that means here what happens we have a cage that means the balls are separated from each other uh, let us say something like 0.1 mm 0.08 mm gap will be there and the balls are retained in their place in a cage that is why they are called guide lm guide with the ball cage the balls do not touch each other the advantage noise level one of the major advantage is you when high speed devices see i told you our lm guides can operate at say 3 to uh, 3 meter per sec for instance now when it is operating at such a high speed what happens the recirculating path the noise will be generated the balls will, the noise normally comes here see the ball will be freely going here they will be hitting tuck, 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 like that so when the speed increases your continuous noise will come that is how the major noise comes in a lm guide in the case of caged guide what happens the balls do not touch at all each other either in the loaded zone or in the return path zone so what happens this ball knocking each other does not happen and that is why the noise level comes down quite significantly particularly at high speeds the noise level can be lower by 8 to 10 decibels at higher speeds now we can build machines with 0 0.0001 that is 0 0.1 micron resolution so you can even program 93.3453 that is to the 0 0.1 micron uh, thousand 10000 millimeter also so that you will get a very fine uh, positioning capability that's why i call finer step motion possible maintenance interval can be longer because the lubrication is maintained in the cage and the ball so we have designed a pocket inside the uh, in the cage such that the ball will be continuously exposed to the lubricant and consequently consumption of lubricant can be reduced and the operating environment can be cleaner these are some of the brief advantages of a caged guide so the lm guide should be capable of providing the long service life expected even when it is operating or exposed to this type of contamination that arises in a machine tool application So, briefly speaking, 
LM guides used in machine tool applications, they need precision, preloading, high rigidity, higher damping. We use mat set and extra protection from contaminants. Now, we will go through each one of these parameters. This is important to understand what exactly it means and how it should be uh, treated when it comes to selecting the guide. These, of course, are important for machine tool and high-end applications normally, not generally critical for general engineering application. Normally, we say P grade is for precision machine tools, H grade is for normal accuracy machine tools, and normal grade is for non-metal cutting applications, general engineering application. Uh, just for a rough idea to you, if you take our uh, typical CNC machines produced in India, uh, uh, let us say uh, approximately 65% uh, of their 65 to 70% they use H grade and the balance P grade, SP grade, SP grade, very few and UP have, we are never used in a machine tool. So four or five percent in SP grade and balance 25 or 30 percent in P grade. Uh, most normally uh, horizontal machining centers, etc. They use P grade. Vertical machining centers they use H grade. Turning machines they use H grade like that. So that was the first parameter. Second parameter is pre-loading of the LM guides. Now, this is very important for all of you to understand. What is preloading? Why preloading is done? And how preloading works? Now, in the case of LM guides, you know there is a LM rail and a LM block. So when you hold the two in correct position, there will be space for inserting balls, right? between the raceways of the rail and the LM block. Now, what we do is, if you, let us say, theoretically, six millimeter is the exact diameter of the ball that can be inserted, imagine. So what happens now, if I were to insert a six millimeter ball, all four raceways, you are, there will be no preload, but there is no clearance. So clearance is zero, preload also is zero. They're, both of them are not there. Supposing if you put a big ball like this, the space available is this, just this is a representative sketch, right? For you to understand the concept. So what happens? The diameter of the ball available was only this, whereas we are trying to put a bigger ball inside. So in my example, if I try to put 6.06, .06, let us say 60 micron bigger ball into this, now what happens? Your race waste will get deformed right that means the ball will be exerting load both on the raceway of the rail and the raceway of the lm block that is how at all the four rows there will be preload so preloading in the case of lm guides is done by inserting oversized balls right and for your information thk we use one micron graded balls. So if you take all the balls which in a LM block, all the balls will be within one micron tolerance. So we should not have one ball, let us say three, four micron bigger, five, six micron smaller, like that. All of them are within one micron graded balls. Supposing if you put 5.9 diameter ball, there is a clearance. So you have radial clearance, zero clearance and negative negative clearance is nothing but interference okay that is how preloading is done in the case of lm guides when you do preloading what happens is you see this sketch this is a vertical uh, horizontal machining center supposing you are exerting a thrust like this drilling what happens if there were no preload the column would have deformed deflected up to this you can see that right whereas when there is preload, the deflection is very, very small. Now, let us look at this. Here, there are two plots. This plot, zero clearance. You see, the top curve is zero clearance, and the bottom curve is preloaded. Now, you see here, 
beyond this point they are parallel that means beyond some point there is no use in preloading the preloading is important only in the zero to that load here you can see here such a large deflection whereas preload small deflection what here from this point onwards they are parallel there is no advantage so we the preloading is normally within the roughly we can say 2.8 times the preload that will come to later okay the, you have to understand the basics what is preload and how much preload simply putting a very big preload meaningless see what happens even when a, if you buy a preloaded lm guide when you are holding the lm guide in your hand still there is load between the lm block and the lm rail because of the preload that's why i told you if you use a preloaded lm guide in a general engineering application where there was no need for the preload your life of the lm guide will come down because even without load the already there is load because of the preload in the case of machine tool i need preload so i am ready to pay the penalty i am ready to forego some life because my performance is important not only life that is why i use a preload now i will take 2 minutes and explain to you the concept of preload please understand this this very important bolted joints spindle bearings ball screw lm guide all of them work on the principle of preload so uh, today the uh, element which we will be looking into in detail are the ball screws uh, the various types of ball screws uh, what are their application and selection uh, what are the uh, selection parameters and uh, we will be also doing certain calculations also and i hope time permits we will be doing a servo analysis how exactly to select a servo motor Uh, for a given application uh, okay we have all this uh, 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 topics to be covered uh, application selection design assembly and analysis so basically you are aware that the, we have two types of screws right most of us uh, are uh, uh, familiar with the lead screw uh, which is a frictional device so there will be no there are no balls in that there will be a friction between probably a phosphor bronze nut or a caster and nut with a steel screw rod the main difference be, both of them of course serve the purpose of providing a drive right so you rotate one of the items like let us say the screw shaft the ball nut will traverse or the reverse also possible any one of the now a lead screw and ball screw the primary difference you should always keep it in mind or the coefficient of friction in lead screw will be typically about 0.1 to point uh, about let us say 0.18 something like that okay uh, depends upon the condition of uh, uh, lubrication whether it is properly there or not Uh, that is the primary one the lead screws because of such high friction as compared to ball screw having 0.003 uh, typically the same rolling resistance as a lm guide the efficiency of conversion that is rotary motion into linear motion right that is the efficiency in the case of a screw so the efficiency in the case of a lead screw may be typically varying between about 15% to 25% rough broad range depends upon lead depends upon your lubrication uh, what sort of uh, status of lubrication let us say as compared to which the efficiency in the case of a ball screw will be typically above 90 it will be typically 93 94 uh, like that right and we say don't take more than 90 nominally we take 90% as the efficiency of a precision ground ball screw any ball screw rolled ball screw or precision ground ball screw so naturally the torque required to generate a thrust 
actual force will be the torque will be nearly five times higher for a lead screw as compared to a ball screw one major feature is there which distinguishes between a lead screw and a ball screw the lead screw is non-reversible right it is self-locking we call it. that means if you were to exert a actual force let us say on the nut the screw will not rotate whereas in the case of ball screw it is reversible because your efficiency is very high so you can convert linear motion into rotary motion in the case of a ball screw right that is why you cannot straight away use a ball screw in a screw jack like a car jack you can only use a lead screw because you can crank leave it it will stay there only okay that is one major difference of course uh, uh, those of you who did their engineering very recently know uh, are familiar with uh, the engineering that lead screw uh, being a frictional device works on pv is a constant pressure into velocity that means when the load increases of course load and the pressure are directly related based on the contact uh, uh, area between the threads velocity comes down or if the velocity goes up the load comes down that is the major uh, let us say one of the constraints in the case of a lead screw and in the case of a ball screw that problem is not there there is no such p into v being a constant is yes, maximum speed one can achieve with a lead screw normally speaking is around 15 meter per minute right qr take a couple of meter per minute either way whereas in ball screws we offer uh, velocities right up to 200 meter per minute that is the speed we are able to offer load of course it depends upon the size of the screw shaft so in our ball screws we can also we can provide one ball screw which can generate 90 tons of load 90000 kilograms one ball screw that much capability we have so with that okay that is the broad picture for you uh, for ball screws uh, as compared to lead screws now of course we will focus only on the ball screws these are accuracy grade uh, we talk of accuracy now what is accuracy accuracy in the case of a ball screw is the cumulative lead accuracy what is the meaning let us take a 10 mm lead ball screw so if you want to move 300 millimeter what the cnc system does is it knows that the lead is 10 mm so uh, it knows that is 10 because you have told the system that right so if you put a 12 mm lead and say it is 10 computer will not know it will still take a 10 now for moving 300 mm the cnc it knows that i have to precisely rotate the ball screw shaft by 30 times that's all it does it does not know anything more it doesn't know whether it has moved 400 mm 200 mm or not moved at all it says i have rotated the ball screw 30 times so i expect that the slide has moved 300 millimeter now when you measure actual movement of the slide the slide might have moved let us say 300.1 millimeter or 299.7 millimeter that means the error cumulative lead error total 30 leads cumulative lead error either it was 0.1 mm on the plus side or 3.3 millimeter on the negative side that is what we call the cumulative lead error so the precision ground ball screws the accuracies available are c0 highest accuracy c1 c2 c3 and c5 is the uh, let us say uh, the on the lower side accuracy wise we have rolled ball screws where uh, which are used in the non uh, material that is used in the material handling some non critical application let us look at the details these are the precision ground ball screws so you see cumulative lead error also called as fluctuation 
over 300 see a ball screw may be 4 meter long another ball screw may be 2 meter long other may be 800 long you cannot compare accuracy lead accuracy that way so what internationally we do we compare over any part of the thread which is 300 mm long 300 mm here 300 mm here 300 mm here wherever you take what is the cumulative lead error that is how we compare the accuracy of balls ball screws so c5 18 micron c3 8 micron you see big jump here c2 7 micron you see just one micron c1 5 micron c0 3.5 micron now you may have some reason to select c3 compared to c5 but anything less than this you should have very very good reason otherwise you are paying through your nose because what happens is we cannot manufacture c2 we cannot manufacture c3 we try to make the best ball screw after manufacturing the ball screw as per your requirement we measure the thread accuracy if the thread accuracy is within whatever is allowed fine then i can supply it to you if it is not then i have to scrap it scrap it means i will not sell it to you i have to once again manufacture the ball screw so if you had ordered say c3 and i measure it and i find 9 micron error was there in one of the 300 mm area we have what is called as a laser laser calibration chart i think next time i should add that in one slide to show you so we measure it in all the ball screws we measure the lead by a laser full length we have so by we can check so if that 9 micron comes i ball screw i scrap i have to make it until i achieve either 8 or better than 8 sometimes you are ordered c3 but when i supply it may become c1 also or c0 also it may be there by that is choice pure uh, chance not choice chance so uh, but you should not exceed it that's all so some of the so i have seen practically c5 ball screws supply most of them are c5 right very few c3 and even fewer c2 out of 100 ball screws of c5 40 ball screws will be better than c2 okay but we don't charge because that was meant as a c5 okay then comes your rolled ball screws so the rolled ball screws are very coarse i told you 50 micron plus minus per 300 c8 100 micron plus minus per 300 c10 plus minus 200 micron per 300 here telescopic rate so let us say 8 300 mm 8 mic 8 micron 600 mm it may be only 11 micron it need it is not 16 micron into 2 it is telescopic rate so whereas here it is directly proportional for 50 micron 300 mm 1 meter about 0.15 millimeter okay that is the kind of a difference between rolled ball screws and precision ground ball screws as regards lead accuracies so how do we do that so here you can see one of the method is double nut preloaded ball screw so there is one nut here another nut here we have a spacer in between we you can imagine when i put a thicker spacer i am forcing this nut and this nut apart right forcing it so the contact angle is like this that means this is forcing this is forcing so here what you can see the if you take the screw shaft the left flank the right flank if you take the nuts the right flank and the left flank are always in contact so whichever way the nut rotates the nut uh, sorry the screw shaft rotates the nut will immediately move and when i start increasing the thickness of the spacer the preload starts increasing this is called double nut preloaded ball screw now here this is a single nut so here what i do i while manufacturing the nut right here i would have started grinding the nut let us say when manufacturing the nut 
I would have ground the full length of the nut uh, threads inside. Whereas here, what I do, I grind up to this half, then I move only one thread. I increase the lead equal to let us say 60 micron, 70 micron. We know that company will know how much and the balance thread will be again normal thread. So technically what we have done, we have one set of threads in the nut only. Screw is continuous. In the nut only, we have one set of threads, roughly half the length and another set of threads, other half of the nut, but between them a gap. So what happens? The, depending upon this gap, the tensile load will increase. This gap will result in contact like this. Okay. This is called single nut offset thread. Why? The threads of the ball nut are offset between them. This is the offset. So this is single nut offset thread. This is the second type of preloading. So you can see here, this is the single nut offset thread. This is double nut with spacer. Okay. Now you see here, this is what we call a time motion diagram. That means that let us say that horizontal table, what we saw in the sketch moves 1200 uh, millimeter right forward and backward assume for a minute so it moves at 30 meter per minute forward at uh where is that six meter per second square acceleration six meter means six thousand millimeter per second square so what we do we calculate what is the uh, acceleration time right v equals U, U plus 80. So time is calculated as 0 0.083 seconds. Let us say the speed is 30 meter per minute is 500 millimeter per second squared. Then using the equation, S equals UT plus half 80 squared. We calculate how much distance was moved in acceleration. So it moved 20.7 millimeter in acceleration. 20.7 millimeter in the acceleration, the balance 1200 minus these two is 1158.6 millimeter in constant velocity. When it is in constant velocity, the force acting on the ball screw is 15.6 kg force. We saw that in the previous page. When it is accelerating, 735.6 kg force. When it is decelerating, because the deceleration, the seal and all will help. We subtract this instead of adding. So this becomes 704.4 kg force. Similarly, for 40 meter, we can recalculate that. So you have certain values, right? So 20.7 millimeter is 1.7 percent of this. 1158 millimeter is. 96% of this, right? So I find out approximately how much percentage, how much percentage, how much percentage. You see, the percentages are here different. Just for you to understand, I made this. Now that we have calculated this, we calculate the mean axial load. Mean axial load, how do we calculate? Equals load F1, 735 square cube, sorry, cube into 0 0.017 that is 1.7 percent plus 15.6 cubed into 0 0.966 plus 704 cubed into 0 0.017 plus 735.6 cubed into 0 0.034 and so on and so forth the cube root of the whole thing is 337 kilonewton the maximum load is out of all this 735.6 is the maximum now for calculating static safety factor use the static load rating given here you see i had selected a ball screw 4016 assume in this case so 4016b from the catalog i read the static load rating and the dynamic load rating 
I calculate the static safety factor using the static load rating and the maximum load. So 79.4 divided by 7.4 kilonewton. 10.7 is the static safety factor. Then service life I calculate using the dynamic load rating. So 33.9 divided by mean load is 3.4. Load factor we have taken 1.5. The whole thing cubed into 10 to the power of 6 revolutions. That means this is 301.6 million revolutions. And I told you convert it into kilometer by multiplying 301.6 by the lead. The lead is 16 millimeter. So 16 into this 4825 kilometer. This is how I calculate the static safety factor and the service life of the ball screw.